Hello, this is Mary Ann Schlegel. I'm a full-time naturalist with the Lancaster County Departments of Parks and Recreation, and I'm delighted to be talking with you today about one of my very favorite things, which happens to be the springtime waterfowl migration through Middle Creek. It's a wildlife management area just on the northern fringe of Lancaster County, and what happens there is just magical. So I hope to share that with you today. This is a picture of a live feed that Middle Creek provides on their website. And what we can see here is part of the 360 acre impounded lake. You can see that it's almost entirely frozen over at this point, which was on the 3rd of February. Now, this wildlife management area is approximately 1500 acres and it is within state game lands number 46, which is about 6,250 acres. This is a Google Maps image basically showing the location of the Middle Creek Wildlife Management Area. And you can see it's pretty much right in the center between Redding, Ephrata, and Lebanon. So it's very central to a large population of southeastern Pennsylvania folks. Now we're going to talk just briefly about how Middle Creek got its start. Um, basically in 1935, Pennsylvania had the first waterfowl refuge at Pima Tuning Reservoir, which is out right adjacent to Ohio. It's in Crawford County out there. And this was really popular with hunters and it was really utilized very, very heavily, but it was so far in the western part of the state that people in southeastern Pennsylvania where there are obviously large population centers, one of the game commissioned for what they called Pima Tuning East. So things came together so that in 1972, the Middle Creek Wildlife Management Area was actually created. Land was acquired over approximately seven years. Um, there were 63 families that were relocated. Um, a couple properties were taken by eminent domain. But basically by 72, the acquisition was complete and the lake which was constructed was built. There were a couple of other properties that were you know, kind of under consideration at this point. And it turned out that Middle Creek really was the very best choice in terms of the cost of land and in terms of the hydrology in this area. So Middle Creek was, was constructed and the idea was that if you build it, they will come. And what people really wanted initially here was a large population of resident Canada geese. And this was again, really designed for hunters. Well, that happened and it succeeded beyond anyone's wildest expectations to the point where we've had to export geese from Middle Creek. What happened though, following that was really interesting because all of a sudden migrating tundra swans were seen, snow geese started coming from the late 70s, bald eagles came from you know, the early around 1974. And at this point, it's become a major stopping point on the migratory route from many different kinds of waterfowl. So this is an example of a creation of a wildlife management area that has far exceeded expectations. This is a nice illustration of the major flyaways in North America that birds are using for migration. And if we take a look at the red, that's the Atlantic flyway of which you know, we are part. And you can see that that line, the dashed line going right across Pennsylvania pretty much crosses in the vicinity of Middle Creek. So, you know, birds are, birds are very attuned to what's around them, what can help them, what can support them in terms of resources on their journeys. And when Middle, Middle Creek was constructed and the lake was filled, it, as we can see, it very quickly became an important stopover. So before we move on and talk about some specific types of birds, what we're going to just go over is what exactly we mean by the term waterfowl, and we're gonna talk about some migration points. So first of all, this sort of generic term waterfowl includes ducks, geese, swans, and a whole bunch of really unrelated birds like loons and grebes and pelicans and coots and cormorants. And all of these birds are dependent upon water in their life cycles. However, what's important about the ducks, geese, and swans is they are in the family Anatidae and they are related. Now, why do birds migrate? Um, typically, food and breeding sites are the drivers for migration. And in the springtime, we can ask, why do so many birds go up to the Arctic? But if we think about what happens up in the Arctic in the summertime, there's basically 24 hours of daylight up there. And what that means is productivity is really, really high. 
Um, invertebrates, the insects are very plentiful. All of that is fantastic for birds. So there also tend to be relatively few predators. There's lots of land available in all the tundra. So it tends to be a really premier spot for birds to raise young. And energetically, it's worth the trip. Now, in the fall, what happens as you know, we think about when you know, migration begins for birds to move back south, further north, ice is going to cover lakes, snow is going to be covering you know, areas on land where birds might have found food. So that's going to force them to move south. Basically, basically their habitat is decreasing. In the springtime, the triggers, like right now, that are triggering birds to move, you know, to some extent, are winds from the south. Day length is getting getting much longer, as we've noticed, especially in evenings. And when we have falling atmospheric pressure and increasing temperatures, especially accompanying those southerly winds, those are triggers for the birds to move north. And what's really interesting about Middle Creek is birds typically will come there from some of the bays around um, you know, the, the Chesapeake or the Delaware Bay, a little bit further south, you know, maybe Bombay Hook, that area. They will start to move up and they will go as far as they can. And what prevents birds from moving further north at this point is going to be the ice cover. So if there's a lot of snow, a lot of ice, they can't move any further and they're going to be, you know, staging for a period of time. Now, birds were a little bit more plentiful at Middle Creek a couple weeks ago, and as our temperature has dropped, and of course the lake is entirely frozen now, they've actually retreated further south. So, you know, they, they move as much as they can, and of course the drive to breed is what's moving them north. Now, they navigate by the sun and by stars, and some birds like coots almost exclusively move at nighttime. They also use the Earth's magnetic field, and they're very, very good at reading topography and remembering it. So it's this combination of things that allows birds to migrate to the point where, especially with the ducks, the geese, and the swans, they will go to exactly the same spot, the same pond, the same tussock where they had a nest that was successful last year, and they'll find the same one and repeat. Now, because ducks and um, geese and swans migrate a little bit differently. That is really reflected in the way that they live. And it turns out that geese and swans mate for life, so they tend to migrate as family units. Ducks, on the other hand, are rather promiscuous and they tend to have a rather solo existence, um, you know, the males and females, once they're completely finished with the mating thing. And females will stay on the nest. They will basically care for the young to the point where they're independent, but then they leave also. So young ducks, when they migrate for the first time, are often migrating with flocks of other birds um, because they don't have their parents with them the way the geese and swans do. Now we're gonna start our discussion of the different birds by beginning with the Canada goose. This is the goose that is responsible for the creation of the Middle Creek Wildlife Management Area in the first place because this is the bird that hunters wanted to be able to hunt in southeastern Pennsylvania and not have to worry about going all the way out to almost Ohio. I'm going to play the call of the Canada goose, which I'm sure is very familiar. Canada, Canada goose. goose. There's no reason for birds like Canada geese to have to migrate if they have the resources that they need right at hand. And that's exactly what's happened here in the Lancaster area. Up at Middle Creek, the agricultural fields have had plenty of food to sustain populations of these over the winter time. And this is also part of the reason that we've seen them becoming a problem around some of our industrial park areas with retention basins and some of the farm fields. There's plenty of food for Canada geese here year round. So there's really no reason for them to leave. Now on this slide, one thing I'd like to just spend a minute describing is the range map on the right hand side. We're going to see a lot of range maps as we go through these birds because it's just a really nice way of depicting where they are in various seasons. The Canada goose has a very simple range map. 
in that these three bands are very kind of prominent going from east to west right across North America. We can see that the purple of which Pennsylvania is part is where the birds are present year round. So there's a year round populations of Canada geese. The dark maroon color to the north is where they are breeding in the summer and the blue to the south is where they are spending the winter time. Now this is a nice picture of a snow goose in flight. Um, something that's really interesting with these geese and swans is that there's no sexual dimorphism. In other words, males and females look the same. So with the snow goose, what's really prominent here is you can see the bright white body and the black wingtips. This is what you notice when the birds are in flight, when they're flying overhead, when they're flocking those black wingtips really stand out against the white and it's a great field mark. Also notice that this bird has a pink bill, which is kind of an interesting color. This is a beautiful picture looking across the lake at Middle Creek towards some of the agricultural fields. And what typically happens is the birds will leave the lake at dawn or early in the morning, go to feed for a while before they come back to the lake. So you can see these, what looks like a cloud of birds over there. Sometimes it looks like snow. It's just gorgeous. And these are some of the sounds that accompany that. Snow goose. Snow goose. When the geese have finished feeding and returned to the lake, it's a beautiful scene with them flying and you can almost imagine that they're drooping their wings kind of like a parachute to kind of cushion their fall as they come back to the water surface. Now the peak of snow goose migration at Middle Creek is very weather dependent, but typically it occurs the end of February into the very beginning of March. On days like that, the numbers of snow geese sighted on one day can exceed 150,000 birds. On days like that, this is the scene as the birds are scared up off the surface of the lake, perhaps by an eagle circling overhead. Now this is the range map for the snow goose. And notice here, this is very different from that of the Canada goose, first of all, in that where the snow goose is breeding, in that maroony color is up along the edges of the Arctic Ocean. You can see it there above Alaska. It's in the Canadian archipelago. It's around the Hudson Bay. It's off of Greenland. And basically these birds are migrating. That's where the yellow color is across this area. And they're migrating to, you know, spend the winter elsewhere too, down around, for example, the Gulf of Mexico. But notice that the population that is crossing Pennsylvania is actually wintering in the bays along the mid-Atlantic coast. Something else I'd like just to mention is that as polar bears are becoming more challenged um, in the fact that they don't have the ice flows that they used to and they're having a harder time obtaining the seals that are really you know, nutritious for them, they're starting to spend more time on land and they're consuming snow goose eggs. These tundra swans are beautiful in flight and I think they're really interesting to contrast and compare with the snow goose. First of all, both the birds are very white, except that the tundra swan is entirely white. They have black bills, they have black feet, and that's different from the snow goose. They also have completely white wings, whereas the snow goose had the black wing tips that were very obvious in flight. And notice too that the swan has a much longer neck than the snow goose did. Here's a nice picture of a tundra swan on its Alaskan breeding habitat. And you can see that in a similar way to the snow goose, this bird is flying all the way up, primarily to be around the edges of the Arctic Ocean again and the Bering Sea. They're on the Aleutian Islands. And their migration area is quite extensive. They basically migrate through almost all of Canada, except for the very north northeastern provinces. And you can also notice how they are wintering on both coasts right along the ocean. And again, they're in the same bays in the mid-Atlantic that the snow geese are. Now here we're moving away from the geese and swans to talk about ducks. 
And in general, there are two large groups of ducks. Ducks are either considered to be puddle ducks or dabbling ducks or diving ducks. And a way to tell the difference right off the bat is if you're looking at a duck and it vanishes underwater, it's a diving duck. If you're looking at a duck and it tips up so that it can be feeding with its head on you know, the floor of a shallow pond, maybe seeding some weeds and things um, you know, that might be growing at the surface or just under the surface, and you see this tail up in the air, that is a puddle duck or a dabbling duck. So we're going to talk first about them. They typically inhabit shallow ponds because they are gonna be eating off the bottom or they're gonna be eating you know, on the water surface, but they're typically in shallow water. So they're gonna be in smaller pods, they're gonna be in marshes, they're gonna be in rivers. And what's really interesting about them is that they usually ride fairly high in the water they can fly if they're scared right off the water surface, they go straight up and their legs are centered under their bodies. And what this means is that they can walk on land pretty well. Something like a mallard you see waddling around its nest, it looks pretty comfortable on land. And that's typical of the dabbling ducks. This is a really beautiful shot of three mallards in flight. You can notice that the first two are males or drakes with the bright green heads, really beautiful chestnut color, sort of through their necks onto their chest. And you can see that the last one is a hen or a female. Notice that the last two mallards here have their wings directed downward. This allows you to see the beautiful speculum there. It's the part of the wing, the trailing edge of the wing. And you can notice that with the ducks, it's a really distinctive color. Um, it's a species specific color here in the mallard. It happens to be white surrounding this beautiful blue for both the drakes and the hens. I'm now gonna play the call of the mallard. Mallard. Interesting, the mallard is the most common duck in the northern hemisphere and has a circumpolar distribution. The range map is very similar to that of the Canada goose and in a very similar way to the Canada goose, all the resources that a mallard needs are present right through the Pennsylvania area, so they are present year round with us. Now these are some black ducks. Black ducks are closely related to mallards but you can notice here that the speculum of a black duck has no white on it. So this is a really good way to tell the difference. They can look an awful lot like a mallard hen. They tend to have more black on the tops of their heads. And in general, their bodies are often a darker color than that of the mallard hen, but still at a distance or in you know a whole flock of ducks, they can look very similar. Now, in a similar way to the mallard, the black duck is present here in Pennsylvania year round. One major difference, though, is this duck is a really eastern duck. It was primarily the main woodland duck here for a very long time, but mallards have been moving east, and at this point, they're hybridizing and in some habitats outcompeting the black ducks. These are a couple of northern shovelers, and they're honestly some of my favorite dabbling ducks to watch at Middle Creek in part because oftentimes they're feeding fairly close to the edges of ponds in places that are readily accessible. A pair will oftentimes feed in kind of a frenzied circle. They swim around in the circle. They're tipped up as dabbling ducks. And what they're doing is they're basically agitating the water column to get food in suspension to facilitate their feeding. They have these comical oversized beaks and um, they're very distinctive in flight or when they're on the water. Notice the drake in flight in the upper right there has a beautiful green speculum that's bordered in black. The female would display that as well in flight and that's a great field mark for her in addition, of course, to her large bill. I'm going to play the sound of the shovelers now. Northern shoveler. <laughs> Wood ducks are a wonderful example of a conservation story that has really been successful as 
with habitat, especially wetland habitat restoration and you know, conservation, numbers of wood ducks have really dramatically increased to the point where they're fairly commonly seen. On the lower left, we have some beautiful drakes. And it's incredible to think that with feathers, you can have such sharp delineations in the colors on their bodies, but they are absolutely gorgeous ducks. The upper right shows a female or a hen. And notice she has two very important distinguishing features. She has a comma-shaped eye ring. She's the only hen among all the dabblers with anything even close to that. And she also is displaying a beautiful speculum there that is blue bordered by white on only one side as opposed to the mallards where it's bordered on white on both sides. Now wood ducks are also cavity nesters, which means that they are looking for holes in trees in which to lay their eggs and you know hatch them. Once the young hatch, they are out of the hole in the tree and they are on the water or you know in areas very close to the water until they can actually fledge and fly. So they are extremely vulnerable once they're out of that cavity. Wood ducks do have a year-round distribution in this area, but what's really interesting is they really don't disperse to breeding habitats. You typically don't see them in pairs on streams until the springtime. And because if they move at all, they just move a very short distance, you know, they're, they're here earlier in the springtime than a lot of other birds, and they also linger a little bit later in the fall. Northern pintails are some other very distinctive dabblers. You can see why they're called pintails, because you can actually see on both the drakes and the hen on the lower left and not quite so much on the upper right, the pintails that they're named for. Very, very good field mark. And also notice how the drakes have a very dramatic stripe of white that goes from the back of their head down their necks, and that's a good field mark. You can also see their speculum there in flight, which is basically very dramatically black and white. This is a closer picture of a pair of pintails. And notice the beautiful dramatic coloration and detail on their feathers. On the range map to the right, you can see that primarily pintails are migrating through here. They winter just a little bit to our south. They're along the coast and they extend all the way across the southern tier of the country down into Central America. When they migrate, they're basically heading north, and they don't go all that far north. They're in our northern Midwestern states, almost all through the entirety of Canada and up into Alaska, so they have quite a wide breeding range. They are fairly shy ducks, so they're among some of the very first. It will scatter if there's any kind of a threat that they perceive. And they also have been observed playing dead um, if they're captured by a fox, which is a really interesting behavior for a bird. Notice the beautiful light brown color on the head of this, p of this pintail hen. That is fairly distinctive among the dabbling hens. We're now going to discuss diving ducks. So as opposed to dabblers, there's some really interesting contrasts here. Diving ducks, as their name suggests, they die for their food. So this is where you can be looking at a duck on the surface and it will just vanish and come up somewhere else. That's a really good indicator that you're looking at a diving duck. Because they're diving and they're typically going after fish, they're gonna be inhabiting larger, deeper bodies of water. So they are in salt water, they're in fresh water, but again, they typically are in deeper bodies of water that have to be larger. They have some really interesting adaptations to allow them to be really great at swimming underwater. So some of these adaptations have to do with the placement of their legs and the structure of their feet. They tend to ride very low in the water. First of all, their feet are really big, they're broad, and they're webbed. And the webbed feet allow them to swim very effectively underwater. Because of the placement of their legs on the back part of their body, they typically are ducks that cannot just spring off the surface of the water like a dabbler and they're in the air flying. They have to do a runny across the surface of the water. There are a couple exceptions, but for the most part, any diving duck is gonna have to take off with a runny on the surface of the water. And um, for some diving birds like loons, which are not diving ducks, but they're an interesting bird to just mention here because they 
can only inhabit really big lakes because they need a very long distance to run on the surface of the water before they can become airborne. We're going to start our discussion of diving ducks by talking about hooded mergansers, commonly called hoodies. You can see on the upper left, that is a drake in flight. And notice the really sharp contrast there with the black and the white on the body and the yellow eye, which is a really different color. You can see the pair of hoodies down below and notice that the hen, you know, in a similar way to the dabblers, she's colored to basically blend in with her surroundings when she's on a nest. You can see though that she has kind of a hood effect on the back of her head and you'll see in a moment what the drake can do with his hood when he's in the mood. I'm going to play the call now for the hooded mergansers. Hooded merganser. This is a beautiful shot of hoodies on the water. You can see the drake in the front with the crest raised and the female in the back with her crest raised as well. Here in Lancaster County, hooded mergansers I typically find on farm ponds. You know, good sized farm ponds are also on the pond below the visitor center up at Middle Creek. I've seen them on ponds over New Jersey in the wintertime. And like wood ducks, they're cavity nesting birds. This is a beautiful photograph of a pair of common mergansers. And you can see, first of all, that the drake in the front has really dramatic coloration between the dark green of his head, black across his wings, and then the completely beautiful snow white color below. You can see the female in the background, the hen. She has what I refer to as a bad hair day with feathers that just kind of go awry in the back of her crest there. Both of them, though, have bright red bills with it have sort of a serration effect that almost looks like teeth to help them snag and hold on to the fish that they're seeking when they're diving. I see these very commonly on the Conestoga River right in central Lancaster County. I'm going to play the call of the common reganser, and this I refer to just personally as snarling. Common reganser. This is a great shot of a common regenzer hen with what is hopefully breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Here we can see mom with her brood of chicks. I've actually seen this on Adirondack lakes in the summertime and it's an incredible treat. Typically they nest in more boreal habitats, but there's a small section of the Adirondacks that's high enough to be considered boreal habitat. You can see on this range map that the common mergansers are definitely wintering through this area and breeding again in that boreal habitat further to our north. It's interesting that they really prefer to nest in cavities like the hooded mergansers, like the wood ducks. And what all of these have in common is their chicks are really, really vulnerable, particularly with the mergansers, because they really don't have a land option. They're not good on land because their legs are placed so far back on their bodies, they really cannot walk very well on land at all. And their young are vulnerable to everything from eagles to snapping turtles. This shows a pair of small, very distinctive diving ducks called bobbleheads. They're affectionately known as bobbleheads in part because they're very small and they pop up and go back down with great rapidity. So they're kind of difficult to follow for a long time with binoculars because they just can disappear so readily. You can see the field marks on the drake on the upper left are really distinctive. There's a beautiful dark iridescence to the head contrasting with this bright white patch on the back of the head. And the hen below has some more subdued colors typical of, you know, hens of these ducks, but she has a bright white patch right behind her eye. Here we see three bufflehead drakes doing their running across the water prior to takeoff.
The range map for these birds shows that they really are seen here as they migrate through. They're wintering along the coast, and I frequently see them in New Jersey on the bays and inlets there right through the winter time. They're very commonly seen too on the pond at Middle Creek right below the visitor center. This is a pair of ring-neck ducks, and these ring-neck ducks often accompany the buffleheads on that pond below the visitor center at Middle Creek. You can almost always be guaranteed to see ring-neck ducks um, early in the springtime at that particular pond. This is also an example of a bird with, I think, a rather poor name because the ring that the name is referring to is seen on the drape on the far right, and it's this very subtle chocolate brown color in the midst of the black between the head and the chest of this bird. Better field marks are the fact that it has a very distinctive coloration on the bill with gray and black and white. So there's a nice white stripe right before the black tip. That's good. There's, you can see for both the drake and the hen, there's a, a very light color right at the back of the bill and the drake, it's white. With the hen, it's a brown stripe right behind her dark bill. And you can also see that the drake has really distinct coloration between a dark back and gray sides with that white stripe between the chest and the side or the flank of the bird. These are again, small diving ducks. They pop up and down very quickly in their water. Like the bufflehead, the ring-necked duck is also migrating through this area. They have a pretty similar distribution to the bufflehead, um, especially where they're wintering. And they're also heading up toward boreal habitat for their breeding. It's interesting that this is one of the very few diving ducks that can take off from the water like a dabbler, in other words, without having to do a running on the surface of the water. Long-tailed ducks are larger diving ducks than the buffleheads and the ringnecks, and they do migrate through this area as they are approaching you know, their breeding season. And this picture shows a drake doing its runny right across the surface of the water. Unlike some of the other diving ducks that have a broader range of wintering habitat, the long-tailed ducks are really limited to coastal environments. So they're gonna be in the bays and inlets right hugging the coast as a matter of fact, I saw them off New Jersey this past winter in December, and I was on the beach, it was low tide, and they were diving at really close range where water dropped off really dramatically right offshore. They were diving and it looked like they were having a blast. This slide illustrates rather nicely the difficulty in identifying these ducks. And what we see on the lower left is their winter plumage. So this is what they look like through the winter season, and you can look at them in this area in the winter time, and that's what you see. You go up to Arctic Canada, however, and the upper right slide shows what they look like when they're breeding. They look like two entirely different birds. And of course, as they're molting, they're gonna be kind of an in-between plumage. So this makes identifying these ducks a real challenge. The photograph on the bottom here shows what's referred to as a raft of long tails or a group of ducks on the water, in this case, long tails. And you can also see really nicely the long tails that are sticking up in several of these drakes. That is what this bird is named for. They also were formerly called old squaw, but long tail is presently the accepted name for these ducks. And you can see a whole variety of plumages in there, everything from winter plumage to what's approaching breeding plumage. You can also notice on the inset range map how their distribution in the winter time is extremely coastal. On the west coast, it's bit, they basically hug the coast of Alaska down into western Canada there, just you know, very, very northerly Washington state you can find them. And they essentially hug the eastern coastline, the Atlantic coastline, right along the Gulf of St. Lawrence, all the way down into Delaware Bay and toward the Carolinas. So again, they're extremely coastal in their wintering habitat. You can see how they migrate through. They're not as commonly seen at Middle Creek as some other birds, but I saw them beautifully over several spring times. So notice that they're heading toward the far Arctic to breed. Now, as we talk about the American coot, we are leaving the ducks, geese, and swans of the Anatchee, and we're talking about some waterfowl that are kind of 
lumped into that category just because of where they are habituating. Now, the American coot is a really interesting bird. This is also commonly seen on that little pond right below the visitor center at Middle Creek in the springtime. This is a picture of a coot with its large lobed feet doing a running across the surface of the water to take off. I love this picture of a coot family moment. And what's really noticeable here is the very sharp contrast between the overall dark gray color of the adult coot, the red eye, and that bright white bill. You can see a little chick to the right. Coots are more closely related to rails than they are to the ducks we've been talking about. And some things about coots are really downright comical, like the fact that they tend to move their head in time with their walking and swimming motions. So they're kind of bobbing their heads as, as they walk and they swim. And in 1931 in Vermont, some coots were noted migrating north by walking, which is really rather strange. Their long legs and very long lobed toes allow them to be really agile on land. So they're pretty good at that. And they are aggressive defenders of territory, as you can see in the coot fight on the lower left. And note again, the size of the foot that that one bird has placed on the other. You can also notice that on the range map, they are basically wintering and migrating through this area to habitat that includes the upper Midwest and you know some of the prairie provinces of Canada, basically for their breeding habitat. Now, when we're talking about Middle Creek, another bird that I just have to mention is the bald eagle because there have been resident bald eagle populations there since the, the 70s. And the bald eagles are really responsible for many of the times when you're looking at a large number of snow geese on the lake and all of a sudden they just all take off. Typically that's when a bald eagle has left a nest and is circling around. And I've actually seen bald eagles eating snow geese on the ice. This is a beautiful mature bald eagle in flight. You can see it actually has a fish there in its talons. And notice with the bald eagles, their wingspan is huge. They have really, really long wings. And notice how those primary feathers at the very end are outstretched almost like fingers. It's a good way to tell a bald eagle in flight. Large, flat wings. And of course, the bright white head and the bright white tail of the mature adult is very striking. This is a nice picture of two mature adult eagles with their chick in a nest. Now the nest they typically inhabit year after year after year, and these birds will also typically mate for life. So they will be in an area and they will just maybe add a little bit to a nest every year to the point where these nests can weigh over a ton. So they're quite enormous. At Middle Creek, you can look across the lake and spot at least one bald eagle nest across the way very, very nicely before the vegetation fills in on the trees. Something else about bald eagles that's really interesting is their call. So I'm going to play that for you. Bald, bald eagle. eagle. I think it's worth mentioning after listening to that rather wimpy call for such a very large majestic bird that oftentimes in movies where the bald eagles are shown, the red-tailed hawk's call is actually dubbed in instead of the bald eagle's call because it sounds much more serious. Now, this is a nice picture of an immature bald eagle in flight. Immature bald eagles are typically very nondescript. Uh, you can sort of see they have huge wings. Again, those primary feathers are distinctive, but they're missing the the really sharp contrast between the dark body and the bright white head and tail until they're about five years old. So for the first five years, until they're completely mature, they show kind of mottled coloration. The picture on the lower left is a beautiful shot of the head and neck of an immature bald eagle. And notice that mottled coloration, but also notice the beautiful bill of a bird of prey. Bald eagles are part of kind of an informal group called the sea eagles, and traditionally they fed primarily on fish. 
Now in the Lancaster area, they're able to find a way to make a living on a lot of other things, including not only snow geese at Middle Creek, but chickens. So we have them year round breeding here in the county, which is a really, really nice thing. You can notice on the range map that traditionally they're found breeding through most of Canada and they basically would winter a little further south in the States. Great blue herons are a very common sight along creeks and streams through Lancaster County as they are up at Middle Creek. They're large herons, very long-legged, long-necked birds who specialize in eating fish. This is the call that typically is heard as they're in flight. Now, great blue herons will stand stock still in the water, watch for a fish, and then snag it and swallow it whole as this picture is showing. Now they're very opportunistic in their hunting and they will eat things like baby alligators as the upper left slide shows in places like Florida and they'll eat muskrats as well as the lower right shows. Now great blue herons will commonly pick up snakes and notice in this particular shot, the snake is attempting to bite the bird. You can see just the left part of the snake, the head is upturned with the jaws wide open there. Frequently snakes will twine themselves around the bill of a great blue heron so the bird literally cannot open its mouth. I personally find it really curious as such a tall, long-legged, long-necked bird likes to nest in trees but that's what the great blue herons do. And they like to nest with a lot of their friends. So the lower right shows a rookery where there are a number of great blue heron pairs nesting together in a couple of trees. You can see in the upper left, an adult is bringing a stick into the nest. Another bird that's commonly seen at Middle Creek is a double crested cormorant. And this is oftentimes just the way you see the cormorant. They're diving birds and they will spread their wings out to dry. You can notice the nice hooked beak on this bird, the nice yellow coloration, and the overall black body. That's a good way to tell a double crested cormorant. In addition to the pose with the wings outstretched and the overall dark color with a, an orangey bill of the cormorant, another really good way to tell the cormorant on the water is the way that it sits very, very low. It rides low and almost what it looks like is a snake coming out of the water with that long skinny neck and then the head with that long bill. So they are very adept at catching fish and the hook on the end of that orange beak is perfect for catching their prey. Notice the range map on the right shows that they're largely migrating through Middle Creek. They're very commonly seen along the coast in the winter time and they're very common in the springtime at Middle Creek. One of my very favorite signs of spring is the red-winged blackbirds. And even though they are basically year-round, you know, here and sometimes their population just moves a little bit further south, when they disperse into breeding territories and the males start to sing in the springtime, it's a marvelous early sign of the season. Now at Middle Creek, they're very commonly seen and heard, for example, on the way out to Willow Point and elsewhere on the property, there's really wonderful habitat as they really like to live in marshy areas. Typically what you'll see is one male perched in a very prominent location singing his heart out and he may have a harem of up to 10 females in the vicinity. This is the call of the red-winged blackbird. Red-winged red blackbird. Black If you're an early riser, dawn is the time to head to Middle Creek to see the geese disperse from the surface of the lake to the nearby fields for feeding. And with this slide, I'm concluding this presentation. I'd like to wish you a wonderful and healthy spring, and I hope that you can find peace and tranquility in the beauty of the natural world around us. Thank you. 
This slide and the next two contain the photo credits for the images used in this presentation.